doing such a good job leading us this morning and good singing this morning, congregation. Some great songs as we remember the salvation God has, has given us. The, the, the song of praise, the hymn of praise written by the, the blind poet Fanny Crosby, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. We remember our wonderful, merciful Savior. And when we're confronted with the ugliness of our sin, and the greatness of the salvation he gave us. How can we do anything but say, Jesus, thank you. And you know, we will only are going to appreciate his salvation as much as we understand how wicked we are, how wicked we were, and how much we needed it as believers this morning. One expression of the wickedness of mankind, the wickedness of of we humans, is racism. If we had to talk about the top 10, if, if somebody, and I imagine it's out there, I didn't go looking, but if you made a top 10 list of the topics that have been covered in the news the last 12 to 14 months, certainly COVID would be at the top, but I'm going to say racism would be in the top five. That racism has been spread, the, the topic of racism ha, has been, the, the, been part of so many news stories these past, this past year, and, um, and, and some of that for a very good reason, because the fact is, racism is, is real. Now, now, I understand, it is like any other hot top, topic, hot button issue that we have out there right now, there are two extremes. There's those that say it's, it's all fake news, it's all made up, it's just this illusion that's being used for political purposes and to sell news stories. But on the other side, on the other extreme, are, are those that are, one, blowing it out of proportion, but two, more importantly, more, more critically, they are, are, are twisting it, they are are proposing a solution that is going to bring more harm than good. And so my goal is for us to find the biblical path down the middle. We don't want to overreact. We don't want the wrong reaction. We don't want the wrong solution that causes more pain and trouble. But neither can we ignore it. And I want to spend some time this morning talking about it and talking about the problem that it is, identifying the problem, defining the problem a little bit, examples a little bit of the problem. And then next week, my plan is to talk about biblical, helpful way forward, how we should react, how we should respond to the issue of racism, Um, a a response, being able to articulate a response. I want to help you to be able to do that. And that'll be more for next week. But racism has been around as long as there have been races, as long as there have been tribal groups, as long as there have been people divided into different groups, there have been fights, there have been finger pointing, there have been, there has been oppression. There have been the oppressors and the oppressed. And that hat has traded places off and on throughout all of human history. I want to show you one example from God's word right at the right back in the Old Testament in the Pentateuch, Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, we'll just look here briefly to show you an example of racism right back at the beginning of the nation of Israel. Numbers chapter 12, um, they are, uh, this is after the exodus from Egypt. Moses is leading them. Moses is God's designated leader for the nation of Israel. There's a heart issue. There's jealousy against Moses for being the leader. His brother and sister are involved in this. And it says in Numbers 12, 1, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman, the African, the black woman, whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble. 
more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out here, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. Now, you know, if you had that sinking feeling in your stomach when your mom or dad or maybe grandma or grandpa said to you and your friends or your siblings, you guys come out here. I need to talk to you. Do you ever, can you relate to that a little bit? Imagine what it was like for Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to have the God of the universe, the guy that, that appears as this big pillar of cloud over the tabernacle by day and a big pillar of fire at night. Imagine what it's like to hear him speak and say, come out here, you three. I need to talk to you. God was a little hot. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. And he said, hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face. I don't use visions. I don't use intermediaries. I speak to him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to talk to him that way, to talk about him? Does God say you're right? Moses shouldn't have married a black girl. Does God say, you're right, that is a problem? Does God make a distinction in this case between the the Jews and the non-Jews? He does not. He is furious. And he strikes Miriam's arm with leprosy. And when Moses prays for her to be healed, God says, you know what? If she had spit, well, let me read it for you. They repent, they apologize. Aaron turned towards Miriam, and she was a leper. And Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, don't lay this sin on us, which we've done foolishly, in which we've sinned. Please do not let her be as one who is dead, whose flesh is half consumed when she comes out of the mother's womb. And so Moses cries out, and he says, Lord, heal her, I pray. And the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? To spit in someone's face was a a sign of, of contempt, of scorn, of rebuke. Of shame. And if that had happened, she'd have to go away for seven days because her father had just publicly humiliated her, disciplined her in front of everyone, and that would be the response. He said if her human father had done that, wouldn't it last at least seven days? He said she needs to go out of the camp for seven days, be treated as a leper, be separate for this period of cleansing, and then she can come back. And he heals her of leprosy. So we see racism and we see God's response. That's not the only issue. The issue was, I need to acknowledge, the issue was a rebellion against Moses' authority. But it's interesting how their jealousy was expressed. I want you to keep that in mind. Because one of the things that, that, that happens when we start being racist is we begin assigning blame to a group that we've labeled. Blame that has nothing to do with them. And God was, was hot. And nailed them for this accusation. And that's interesting because I, I need to say something that really didn't work into my sermon and my notes and my PowerPoint. But I wanted to remind you and we'll talk about it later. There is only one Race, using that word race. Um, And really, the Bible talks about peoples. Talks about geographic groups, people groups, ethnic groups. Um, but, uh, But there's only one people group that God has ever set aside as special. Who is that? It's not the Americans, is it? It's not the whites. It's the Israelites. And even 
with setting them aside as a special people group. He did it for the purpose of making them, giving them the job of leading people to himself. Of inviting people to be honorary members of that people group. Of calling people and making a way for people to be proselytes to worship the true God. And I want you to keep that in mind. It'll come out a little bit later when we look at a different passage. But God set the Jews aside. And it was never about their skin color. It was never really about them that they were a superior race. You, you don't see that said anywhere. In fact, in fact, almost the opposite is said. Because God says, you were a nobody. Abraham was just some pagan from Ur of the Chaldees, from Mesopotamia, that was, was worshiping his false gods, and God of the universe decided to talk to him and invite him into a covenant. And Israel only gets their status because of the covenant that God made with them. And the blessings of those covenants, of that covenant, was to trickle down to all the rest of the people of the world. And, and, and what we see in, in Romans, what you need to realize in what we see in, in uh, Romans 11 and what we see through history, Romans 9 through 11, and what we see down through history is Israel was to make God great among the nations. And instead, he has to give this indictment. You have blasphemed me among the nations. You have made my name stink. And that's why God had judge them and turn from them. And for a period of time right now, God's working through and God just clumps all the rest of us into the Gentiles. And actually in the new Testament, what God does is he even in a sense, he removes all those distinctions for the time being. And he just says, I've considered you all guilty. And that's why it says in Romans three, all have sinned. And Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And he's made us one, one problem, a sin problem that has plagued all races, all nations, all people groups. And there's one solution, and that's Jesus Christ. His death on the cross. And that's the view we see in the New Testament. Well, let's talk about racism in U.S. history. We have some examples, some glaring, unavoidable, undeniable examples we'd like to forget. I think I'd like to forget them. First of all, there is um, slavery, right? Right from the beginning, George Washington had slaves. There is our treatment of Native Americans. Don't hear about that as much, but I want to talk about that for just a minute. Did you learn about the Trail of Tears in your U.S. history classes when you were in school? And many of the other atrocities that we inflicted on Native Americans? In U.S. history, the forced relocation during the 1830s of the eastern woodland Indians of the southeast region of the U.S., including Cherokee, Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw and Seminole, among other nations, to, Indian to the Indian Territory west of the Mississippi, estimates based on tribal and military records suggest that approximately 100,000 indigenous people were forced from their homes during that period, which is sometimes known as the removal era, and that some 15,000 died during the travel, their journey west. The term Trail of Tear invokes the collective suffering of those people that those people experienced, although it is most commonly used in reference to the removal experience of the Southeast Indians generally and the Cherokee Nation specifically. The physical trail consisted of several overland routes and one main water route, and by passage of the Omnibus Public Lands Management Act in 2009, stretched... I'm sorry, just lost my spot. Stretched some 5,045 miles across the portions of nine states, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. 
The discovery of gold on Cherokee land in Georgia, 1828 and 29, catalyzed political efforts to divest the Indians east of the Mississippi of all their property. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 authorized the U.S. president to negotiate with tribes for land sessions and removal to Western territories. Many Native people were forced from their homes and most undertook the westward journey under severe duress. 15,000 approximately died of exposure and disease on the trail, which became known as the Trail of Tears. Although the Trail of Tears is most closely associated with the Cherokee and other Southeast tribes generally, perhaps one-third to one-half of the 100,000 people removed were Northeast Indians. Just a little reminder of the fact that our past is not innocent and, and it's not unblemished. But slavery came to an end with what? The Civil War. But did our treatment change? Did, uh, did the oppression really end for all the, the blacks, the African Americans? In, in fact, how many of you heard talk or, or found out what Juneteenth was this past year? Do you know what Juneteenth is? Did you read about that at all? Did you know that for a long time, there were several places down south where the slaves didn't know the emancipation had taken effect? And, 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 and then, and, and so you, you, I encourage you, go look that up on Wikipedia today, after church, and, uh, and, and read about Juneteenth. Uh, it, it, it's kind of sad. But not only that, but then there were the Jim Crow laws. How familiar are you with those? A while back, I had to look that up. I had always heard it. But, but I had to look it up to, to get a better picture of it a while back. The Jim Crow laws. Let me, let me just read to you a couple excerpts. This one's from Wikipedia because we don't have time to have a full-blown history lesson here today. But it's critical we understand. State and local laws that enforced racial segregation in the southern United States and elsewhere within the United States. These laws were enacted in the late 19th and early 20th centuries by white southern Democrat denominated state legislatures to disenfranchise and remove political and economic gains made by the black people during the Reconstruction period. So after the Civil War, the Emancipation Declaration, and the Reconstruction period, and, and blacks begin to, to actually start to, to advance in society a little bit. They start to get educated. They start to get jobs that, that they get to keep the profits from. They get to have their own land. Or, or even through sharecropping, have better arrangements that for some of them were, were very good, and they liked that. Well, down south, they were a little bit bitter about that and didn't want to see the blacks' situation improve. Didn't like how it began to cut in on profits. Didn't like the fact that no longer were they working for them for free. And so the Jim Crow laws were, were instituted. And, and I just want to say by passing, something that might be worth your, your time to look into a little bit is genetic determinism. Because what we also have happening during this time, both, both the, the progression of evolutionary teaching, the adoption of evolution, beginning to believe that we came from monkeys rather than being created in the image of God, all of us. And then believing that we have uh, uh, animals in our ancestry, then, then believing that certain races were farther down, they were less evolved. They were intermediate. You had those ideas around. You had, you had people believing that certain races, certain people groups were incapable of developing their intelligence to the level that the Nordic tribes, those from, from, from Northwestern Europe, like that we would come from, many of us who are here today that settled Pennsylvania, 
that, that we would always be intellectually superior. And here's something that helped promote that, um, which came after the beginning of Jim Crow laws, granted, but helped keep them going for so long and helped with develop racism. Here's something that was going on is, is that belief that we needed to stop those races from, from propagating so much because they were going to draw us all down. And one of the things that supported that were intelligence tests that were given by the army for World War I, for, for soldiers entering in, in the World War I era. They found out that the black people were scoring, the black men were scoring lower on the intelligence test, the IQ test, than white men. H have you heard this before? Now, why might that be? The going theory was that they were a less superior race. And they would always, they would never be able to have the level of, of IQ that the whites did. That was what was sold, and that's what fed racism and segregation for so long. And what Margaret Sanger, the founder of what illustrious organization? Planned Parenthood? That, was, that is Planned Parenthood's history. That's their roots, eugenics. And that's what it was started for. And that's the philosophy it was built on. But here's one reason why blacks would score lower on those IQ tests. Probably the main reason. The reason. They weren't being schooled when they were slaves. Nor were they given access to education. And looking back at the tests, they were not designed to be able to put people on an even playing field regardless of their education. Some of the questions very much relied on the knowledge of white American culture and schooling that they did not have. But it helped to feed this idea and it helped to keep these kind of laws going. This uh, sign of the segregation. Segregation covered all areas of life. It was, they had certain bathrooms, certain drinking fountains, certain buses. And then when they had to ride on the same bus, they had to be in a one section. They had their own rail cars or sections on the rail cars. If their section was full, there was no riding on the rail car. You just booted off or booted off the bus until the black section had an empty seat next time. And it went on and on. And there, there's a movie that I, I would, I encourage you to watch with a filter because of the language in it. But how many of you have seen Hidden Figures? It gives you just a little glimpse of what that would be like. It's, an, it's, a, it's a, based on a true story of these ladies that, that played a major role in our space program during the space race. And you get a little glimpse into the injustices that were still being inflicted against them in that era of our history. Another good movie that was made by oh, Christians, a wonder, an excellent film, I think you'd like it even if you don't like football, is Woodlawn. And I encourage you to watch that movie with your family. Um, that comes in the 70s. Do you see the date for the Jim Crow laws? How many of you were alive in 1954? It really wasn't as long ago as we'd like to pretend it was. And then, on top of that, do you remember the whole speech, segregation now? Or segregation then, segregation now, segregation forever? That was in 1967. When George Corley Wallace, January 14, I'm sorry, 1963, in his political speech, looking to be elected yet again to an even higher office, made that statement to great cheering by some. Um, according to the Brit where did the name Jim Crow come from? Jim Crow was the name of a minstrel routine. Actually, Jump Jim Crow, performed beginning in 1828 by its author, Thomas Dartmouth, Daddy Rice, and by many imitators, including actor Joseph Jefferson. The term came to be a derogatory epithet for African Americans and a designation for their segregated life. 
Some other expressions of racism in our history, substantiated by history. So we have slavery, we have the Jim Crow laws, the treatment of the Native Americans, then the Ku Klux Klan, 1870s. 1915, they had three eras. The first Klan was established in the wake of the American Civil War and was a defining organization of the Reconstruction Era. Organized in the southern United States, it was suppressed through federal intervention in the early 1870s. It sought to overthrow the Republican state governments of the South, especially by using voter intimidation and targeted violence against African American leaders. Each chapter was autonomous and highly secret as to membership and plans. It's Numerous chapters across the South were suppressed around 1871 through federal law enforcement. Members made their own often colorful costumes, robes, masks, and conical hats designed to be terrifying and to hide their identities. The second Klan started small in Georgia in 1915. It grew after 1920 and flourished nationwide in the early and mid-1920s, including urban areas of the Midwest and West, taking inspiration from Dr from D.W. Griffin's 1915 silent film, The Birth of a Nation, which mythologized the founding of the first Klan, it employed marketing techniques and a popular fraternal organizational structure. Rooted in local Protestant communities, it sought to maintain white supremacy, often took a pro-prohibition stance, and it opposed Catholics and Jews, while stressing its opposition to the alleged political power of the Pope and the Catholic Church. This second clan flourished both in the South and the Northern states. It was funded by initiation fees and selling its members a standard white costume. The chapters did not have dues. It used K words, which were similar to those used by the first clan, while adding cross burnings and mass parades to intimidate others. It rapidly declined in the later half of the 1920s. And then we have the third era. The third and current manifestation of the KKK emerged after 1950 in the form of localized and isolated groups that use the KKK name. They have focused on opposition to the civil rights movement, often using violence and murder to suppress activists. It's classified as a hate group by the Defamation League and puts, I'm, by the Defamation League, and puts the total KKK membership around 3,000 nationwide, while the Southern Poverty Law Center puts it at 6,000 total. Um, they, again, make frequent references to a false, mythologized perception of America's Anglo-Saxon blood, hearkening back to the 19th century nativism. Although members of the KKK swear to uphold Christian morality, the group is widely denounced by Christian denominations. We get that blame because of the fact that it was in largely Protestant areas that it had its power in its second era. And hate crimes are still happening. Um, of all the categories of hate crimes, racism is still by far the greatest, the largest. Um, these are hate crime statistics from the Department of Justice, the uh, the, the, the more turquoise color is, is 2019, and uh, the purple, 2018. You see the other categories there, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, and, and gender. Um, but, but by far, race, race is the biggest issue, and religion is the second. And just a definition of hate crime, it's a crime motivated based on bias, based on hate. Well, we as humans like boxes. We want to categorize people. We want to categorize everything, and we like to categorize people. We, we put people in a box based on their skin color, based on maybe their accent, based on their occupation, based on their location, or based on their wealth. And there's other categories, right? Based on education. We like to put people in boxes. Is that really fair? Does that really describe what people are like? Do, does having more money make you better? Are you necessarily more intelligent? Are you necessarily more upright? Are you somehow wiser? Does actually having a degree and a PhD at the beginning of your name, does that really make you wiser? Does it have anything to do with your character? And on we could go. 
and the continent that God decided that you would be born on. How about that? Does that affect your value? But we tend to do that. Not only that, we not only put people in boxes, but then we judge by our boxes. We label some groups as unfavorable, usually due to a limited or edited understanding of them. We treat the whole group according to the label that we've put on the box that they belong to. And further, the next step is we make them the scapegoat for our problems. That's what was being done to the blacks in the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Labeled, described, whole group. And then we start assigning blame. They're easy scapegoats. Martin Luther King's famous, I have a dream speech. He said, I, have a dr- I still have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day, out of the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, we'll be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of oppression will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their character. So let me ask, what part of that is biblical? Because I'm just going to tell you that, that Martin Luther King was, was, was not always the epitome of Christianity, nor was his theology always 100% biblical. But about those statements, is there anything you can find to speak against them from Scripture? And would not God, does not God want us to judge people not by, God forbids us to judge people's heart. Why? Why aren't we supposed to judge motives and hearts? What's that? Do we really know what's in people's hearts? Our hearts, the human heart, is deceitful and desperately wicked. It's the condition we're all born in. And God says we can. Does God forbid judging? Is God anti-judge? What's the truth about judging that we see in the Bible? Number one, he's the true judge, and his standard is the true standard. But he tells us to judge people. He says we can know people by their what? I'm not even going to use the word character, because character takes a while to identify. But it's ultimately through actions. We judge people by their actions. That's what we have to use when you go to court and there's a trial. We're determining what were your actions. Even the term hate crime, it, it bugs me a little bit because if you killed somebody, it really, it's a murder and needs to be judged regardless of your, what was in your heart at the moment. It just needs to be judged. But it is especially upsetting to find out that somebody killed someone just because of their race or their religion. But we're to judge people by actions. And actions... The culmination of actions are based on what your character is. Actions both express and form character. So God says that we do judge people by their actions. What did James say? And forgive me for not having my slides up. But God does call us to judge people by their works. And James, he says, you'll know, their, you'll know faith by what? By works. Faith without works is dead. Doesn't matter how much I say I believe. What do I do? How do I act? In Genesis 9, 56, so, so we, um, 
we, we tend to judge by the boxes we put people in. But what God tells us to do is to judge individuals by their works, to value people, to value all people by the value he gave them as image bearers. Because it's not even your actions that determine your value. Now, I believe in capital punishment. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. For what? The verse that's on the screen right now, Genesis 9, is for murder. You see, back under the Old Testament law, if you stole from me, or if I stole from you and I got caught and it was proved I was guilty, I was to restore to you not just what I stole, but what? Four times. That was my punishment. But when you steal a life, you cannot return it. And you certainly can't add three more to it. And that's why the only payment for that crime was, was murder. I mean, was, was, was death that was executed by government. Romans says, and, and Paul wrote in Romans... Um, God wrote through Paul in Romans that government was there to, to, to judge, to protect what was good, promote what was good, and judge what was bad, and they do not carry the sword in vain. So it's to be inflicted by government. And we're going to actually talk about a biblical view of government as part of this series down the road a little ways. But, but I want to say that, but we, we can't decide, you know, I don't like your actions, so I'm going to kill you. That's not our decision. But as a society, we establish government because God gives it to us, and the government has laws, and, and biblically, it would say that capital punishment is fitting punishment for murder, intentional murder. And so the government, the state can inflict that judgment. But it's not because the human's value went down. That's where I'm headed with this. Our human value doesn't change by our actions. Please think about that for a while. Toss that around. Maybe you want to argue with me later. But our value as humans isn't changed by our actions. We may, have to, we may forfeit our life by our actions, but it's not because the value of our life changed. And so we need to value humans the way God values them. But I want to talk to you about... I want, I want to show you this video to see if you can spot the racism. Because racism is a very elusive critter that we often deceive ourselves, we don't have it. Can you spot the racism in this? I'm Ami Horowitz, and I'm here in Berkeley, California, to find out if voter ID laws suppress the black vote. Do you have an opinion on voter ID laws? Uh, Yeah, they're usually pretty racist and they're, they're bad. I think voter ID laws are a way to perpetuate racism. Would you say they're, would you go as far to say they're, they're, those laws are racist? For sure. Do you think it suppresses the uh, African American vote? Definitely. Uh, because they're less likely to have state IDs. Minority voters are less likely to have the kinds of IDs that have been um, described or required. These type of people don't live in areas with easy access to DMVs or other places where they can get identification. You can always get IDs um, you can do over the internet. Does that also would make it difficult for, for black people in particular? Yeah, you have to have access to the internet. You have to be able to pay an internet service provider for certain fees. Do you think that's harder for black people to go online? Well, IDs? I feel like they don't have the knowledge of how, of like, how it works. Like, a lot of people have smartphones, but you might not have data. For most of the communities, they don't really know what is out there just because they're not aware or like, right. they're not informed. I also think there's a repression of like, black voting with um, how they, how if you're a convicted felon, like you're not allowed to vote and everything. And when you look at swing states like Florida, that's a huge population of the, of the like African American. What were some of the racist comments in that? Don. 
Okay, they throw in a whole group in a box. Whole group right in the box. What else? What's that? Okay, but what, what were the things said, though? What were the things said that were racist? Okay, so it sounds like they're repeating things. They just assume they're poor. They are poor. Huh? Why do you say that? What was said? Okay. I. What else? Anything else? They just keep talking about them. That voter ID laws somehow are all about them, or against them. Okay. Here's the things that I have tried to just list that were said. Not making any assumptions. Not making any conclusions. Just what was said in those few minutes, those quick interviews. Black people and other minorities are less likely to have driver's licenses and state IDs. We heard that, right? Not, not drawing conclusions, it was said. Um, black people are less likely to be able to access the internet. Why? Well, they might be poor. Well, anyway, they just said that. We'll just go with that. They don't, quote, know how things work. They live in areas that don't have DMVs or they can't get to the DMV. And they, this, that was harsh. Did you catch that? Yeah. I wonder if she slowly was realizing what she was saying as she got it out. But that's the way racism works in our minds. We don't, we don't see it. And sometimes when we start to talk about it, then, wow, I just realized what I did, what I've been thinking, what I've been believing. Now, I have some responses to that, but we don't have time to look at that. You can look up that interview on YouTube easy enough. So I'm just going to skip right over that. Um, Sorry, I went too far. There we go. What is God's view in conclusion, what is God's view? Would you please turn with me to Acts chapter 2? In, in closing, I know what time it is. Acts chapter 2. What is God's view? Who's the gospel for? It says in John, in John 3.16, For God so loved... Not just the Israelites, not just the white Anglo-Saxons, not just the Americans, the whole world. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Now I want you to see something. There's people from all over, from the Mediterranean area and from the Middle East, from Africa, from Italy. So, so today's countries, Europe, Greece, Turkey, 
all the Middle Eastern countries and Africa. People from all over. Now, you say, but yeah, it said they were Jews. But they weren't just Jews. Did you catch that one phrase? Both Jews and proselytes. From all over the known world. And that's who God chose to be the audience when he inaugurated the church age. Because what does it say in verse 17? And it shall come to pass. This is Peter quoting Joel. And here's what happens, by the way. When people talk about Acts 2, they talk about the church, talk about the Holy Spirit. They talk about tongues. They talk about Joel and prophecy. And they get all caught up in trying to figure out what, were the, what all that means. And what it says and, 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 and whether we, what kind of view of tongues we have and what kind of view of spiritual gifts and Holy Spirit and what kind of view of prophecy and how do you interpret the Old Testament prophets. And we're missing the main idea of this whole passage. That God, God brought people from all over the world and worked a miracle, whether a miracle of speaking or of hearing, doesn't really matter for this point, main point, so that they could hear the gospel. Because what does it say? What did Joel say? I'm going to pour out my spirit, verse 17, on what? All flesh, all peoples, no discrimination between races, ethnic groups, no gender discrimination because your sons and your daughters are going to speak and prophesy. Both the young men and the old men are going to see visions and dreams. Both the maid servants and the men servants will receive the Holy Spirit. He cuts through ethnic groups. He cuts through all of that. And, and we'll have to develop this more next week. But we get down to verse 21, last half. It says, but whoever does what? Calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is not discriminating in his people certainly should not. Our shared origin in Acts chapter 17, from one blood, God made all the nations of the earth and predetermined their boundaries, their timeline. Matthew twenty two thirty nine, 39, Galatians 5, 14, James 2, 8, love your neighbor as yourself. The expert, the lawyer, Asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? And what did Jesus say? He told a story. About the race that the Jews didn't like. The Samaritans. Showing love to a Jew on the road that was beaten up and an inconvenience and dirty and bloody and possibly dead. He picks him up. He takes him to a place. He pays for him to be taken care of. He was a Samaritan. The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That's the answer to who's my neighbor. And so I want to ask you as we close in prayer. Do you generalize and make assumptions? about people groups or ethnicities? Do you assign character based on experience? Do you discriminate in your actions, your choice of friends? Do you discriminate in who you'll share the gospel with? Do you say, I'm not a racist, but... Do you laugh at racist jokes? Believe that racism is no concern of yours? Feel frightened or uncomfortable around people of color? Say things like, well, if they want our help, they should be nicer or more respectful. Or stop talking ghetto. Or do you believe certain people groups are helpless, incapable of being successful or independent? This stuff's been promoted for a long time. We need to guard against it. We need to root it out. And we need to look at people the way God has called us to look at people. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for loving us all. Help us to see where we discriminate. Help us to repent, confess. Help us to love as you love. In Jesus' name, amen.